I am Anna Seewald and this is Authentic Parenting, a podcast about growing ourselves while raising our children. I'm a psychologist, educator, and parent coach. And on this podcast, I explore how you can connect to your authentic self, practice radical self-care, and raise emotionally healthy children. Let's break the cycle of generational trauma for a more peaceful, kind, and compassionate world. Today, Panic Proof, Holistic Solutions to End Your Anxiety Forever. I am speaking with Dr. Nicole Kane. She is the author of a brand new book, Panic Proof, The New Holistic Solution to End Your Anxiety Forever. She holds a degree in clinical psychology, is trained in EMDR, and is licensed as a naturopathic physician in the state of Arizona. Her approach to mental health is multidisciplinary, medical, psychological, and holistic. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. It's packed with practical advice, and I absolutely loved Dr. Nicole's energy and her delightful personality. One thing I really like about her approach is the nine types of anxiety. Stay tuned and learn more about your own type. We have covered the topic of anxiety on the podcast on numerous occasions. After a quick search in the Authentic Parenting podcast, I discovered that I have talked to over 10 experts on this topic. There is my conversation with Dr. Ellen Vora that really changed my life, The Anatomy of Anxiety, another phenomenal conversation that was truly eye-opening for me is a philosophical understanding of anxiety with Samir Chopra. And stay tuned, I will be speaking with Samir again very soon on the podcast. Then there is a conversation with Dr. Denise Tiawari, why anxiety is good for you even though it feels bad. Another episode that is really helpful is Unwinding Anxiety with Dr. Judd Brewer. And there are a few other episodes like Anxiety with Denise Turch. It's an earlier episode published in 2018. Helping Kids to Manage Emotions, Ease Anxiety and Stay Focused, episode released in 2020. Another episode is called Tips for Managing Anxiety, Stress, and Overwhelm During Lockdown. That was also released in 2020. And several other episodes. I will link to all of those episodes in the show notes. If you are interested in learning more about anxiety, please be sure to check them out. And now, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Nicole Kane. And thank you for listening. So, Nicole, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I am so delighted. Uh, you just brightened my mood, as I said, with your beautiful yellow top. <laughs> it brightens my mood, too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I really love the book and it's so practical. I'm trying to get as much out of you in this short time that we have together as possible. And I have to be honest, we've done a lot of episodes on anxiety and you can imagine all the experts and the people on social media who do talk about anxiety have been on this podcast before, but I feel like your book is such a good practical book. You know, while some of those experts talk about an angle or certain aspect of anxiety or philosophical understanding of anxiety, we have done an episode on that. I feel like your book brings everything like together and the exa the, um, the practices are so rich and, you know, rooted in latest research because I also follow those things. And 
I am so happy to see everything in one place. Oh, that was the goal is to look at it with respect to the latest research into trauma informed neuroscience from a holistic perspective, which I think is so needed. We have a need for conventional medicine and counseling, but there's also a really untapped space for how we can support our loved ones using natural methods. And I think the paradigm of being panic proof is it's something that people are really getting excited about right now. And we're seeing this change in healthcare and more of a an honoring of the body and acknowledging its healing abilities model. And so my heart was to bring all of that together in a way that teaches you how to actually heal from anxiety and not just like feel like you have to employ a million different strategies to manage it. Yeah, I agree. And I can attest that having done without your book, obviously, but having done this work of truly healing my, if you want to use like very modern language, my trauma, my nervous system regulation, if I've done all of those things and I can tell that it all works Mm -hmm. and I'm in a different place today completely. I have made so many changes, lifestyle changes and how I live my life. And it's not like I need a strategy in the moment. I am well equipped and my anxiety, I haven't even felt those terrifying panic attacks or anxiety attacks in a very long time. I so admire that. And people need that story of hope where you can take it from, oh, this is all nice and sparkly and unicorns and great, but really like the proof is in the pudding. Does it really work? And so I hear you saying like, you are an example of how this can work. Yes. Everything you talk about in your book, I've done and I've tried. Obviously I have my own versions of those things, right? I am not throwing myself, I'm not using every method or, but I have found what works for me. And it's just amazing to live from this ease and peace and Even if anxiety comes, I know how to be with that anxiety in that moment. I'm not scared of it anymore. I remember before I wrote this book, when I was going through my own emotional crisis, I needed someone like you to say that. I remember feeling so hopeless that I could actually get better. A lot of the narrative is managing How can I manage my anxiety? How can I manage my panic attacks? And so I'm so grateful that you're out there. You're talking to these different experts. You're providing information on different perspectives. It's just such a breath of fresh air. So I honor you. Thank you. I learned so much through doing this podcast, like for nine years, you know, it's like, for sure, I have, you know, applied all the things that I've learned into my life. But could you briefly talk about, you have this burrito, the rotten burrito example in the book. Could you talk about symptoms and problems and how sometimes we think the problem is the symptom and how that's misleading? That's the giant paradigm shift is looking at our symptoms as indicators of what needs healing and how, as opposed to looking at symptoms as the problems itself. And so the analogy that you're bringing to mind is that if you buy a beautiful, shiny new car and there's a big air freshener in there, so it smells like strawberries or whatever lovely smell there is, everything seems good and fine. But then when that strawberry air freshener loses its potency and you notice an unpleasant smell, the the more dominant medical model will say unpleasant smell, bad, make it go away. Let's get another air freshener. We suppress it or cover it up or palliate it. And so examples of that in medicine would be maybe using a benzodiazepine like Xanax or naturally we may recommend like valerian root or theanine. But this paradigm is different because we have the opportunity to ask the question, 
what is this smell telling us is going on? There's something to it. It's not there just to make me miserable. It's there to tell me something. And so then we have the chance, the opportunity to open the glove box and we discover the source of the smell is a rotten burrito. And so we can take the burrito out. And another metaphor may be if you have weeds in your garden and you don't want them there, you can cut the tops off. You can hide the information that they're there or you can pull them out by the root. And so this paradigm not only believes that in the wisdom of the mind and the body that it will tell us what needs healing, but that the unique nuance of the expression can tell us how to heal. And another example is a mechanic. If you smell maple syrup coming out of a broken down car, that will tell them something different versus if they smell gasoline, it can help with diagnosis. And that is what this whole book is founded on. Yeah. So basically you are asking to take a look at the root cause of the problem and addressing it, the why. And I love that that there is a chapter, I think it says uncovering, listening to the secret, secret messages of anxiety. And I remember when I interviewed Ellen Vora, she posed that question to me. She said, so what does your anxiety tell you? And I was like, wow, what does my anxiety tell me? I think it's such an important question because instead of managing the anxiety, we want to get familiar with it, become friendly with it and become curious instead of just avoiding or treating the symptoms. What is the difference between panic attacks and anxiety attacks? You know, the traditional way of looking at it from the DSM, which is the the Diagnostic Statistical Manual that the American Psychiatric and the American Psychological Association teaches, is it talks about them as separate, where an anxiety attack would be a flare of underlying anxiety. So someone is anxious every day, but then it becomes really, really big, like a huge attack. And then they describe as panic attacks is it feels like it comes out of the blue. But if we look at the research into some of the causes of that, is they're really quite similar. We see brain areas involved in the manifestation of panic and anxiety. We see similar gut imbalances involved. We see trauma and adversity and overwhelm involved. We see diet and lifestyle changes involved. And so the way that I have found makes more sense. I think a better working model is to look at it on a spectrum. And I teach about this as the stoplight strategies, Mm -hmm. which is such a great way to explain it to kids is because we can look at a a stoplight and we have the green light. You feel really good. We're not an autonomic arousal or we're calm or focused. We're creative polyvagal theory. They talk about this as, is your Mm -hmm. social connectivity, your calm state. And then they go, Yes. Your inventual bagel. <laughs> yes. And so we can lean on that. There's a ton of research behind that too. And then the yellow light is now we're starting to notice signs of autonomic arousal and in generalized anxiety disorder, that may be a person's baseline, but the body will whisper before it shouts. And so oftentimes you will have signs that you are going into the yellow zone before you go into the next zone, which is the red zone, which is panic and crisis, whether it's in a panic disorder or in a anxiety disorder. Yeah, I agree. It doesn't come out of nowhere. It just accumulates over time. And we can definitely develop strategies in connecting with our body, right? In attuning to our senses and body and all of that to even predict when it's coming. You talk about resisting versus receiving. I also love that very much. Could you expand on that and tell me what are the signs of receiving and what are the signs of resisting? And what are you talking about when we say that? Yeah, I have this like quote going through my head of what we deny will amplify and what we will resist will persist. And so in your body's wisdom and compassion, it will give you information like, Hey, I'm out of balance. 
And if you receive that information and then use that information to restore balance, then those symptoms will go away. But when we resist it or suppress it or ignore it or deny it or whatever we can do to try to avoid it, the voice of the anxiety will get louder. We'll go into that red light zone. And a really tangible example of this before we go into the specific signs of each is in Michigan here, we have riptides. And so a riptide, it can be just offshore and it can just suck you out and spit you out to the sides. And unfortunately, a lot of people get caught in riptides. And if they don't know how to handle it, they can drown or they need rescued. And so one of the best ways to handle a riptide is to just relax and then let your body float where the water takes you and it will send you down the, the shore and then you can swim in. And so it's the same kind of idea with the symptoms from our body. So the more that we try to control it or hold on to it, the more intense it gets. And so that's resisting. Resisting is I'm trying to avoid it. I'm trying to talk myself out of it. I'm trying to suppress it. I am not acknowledging it. I'm trying to talk myself out of it, right? And then receiving is kind of just like relaxing into the sensation and noticing it and feeling it. And I'm curious for you, if you resonate with this, because you've gone through this work and gone through this journey, do you have a perspective of your resisting versus your receiving and how that looked and what that did for you? I'm just super curious. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, when you resist, it amplifies for sure. And it feels like you're going to die. It's just, it becomes more terrifying. But when you learn to receive it, it's not like it's not scary or unpleasant. It still is unpleasant, but over time, the more you practice being embodied with your bodily sensations and having a more open, curious mind, instead of saying in in the past, I would have done, I would have escaped if I entered into a situation that provoked an anxiety attack, I would have left. I would have not engaged or participated. I've done, that was my coping strategy, right? Escape and avoidance. So the first step was to remain with with the experience. No matter what, this is not going to kill me. This is just an anxiety after educating myself and being curious, saying, what is this telling me, this anxiety? And staying present with the sensation level experience, and then engaging in breath work, calming my nervous system. That helps me a lot, like grounding, feeling my feet on the floor or uh, holding onto something hard and steady, like pushing a wall. Or if I was in a store once and it hit me, I grabbed the shopping cart steadily and I felt that I was grounded and I was steady. And then I noticed my breathing change. I try to, you know, belly breathe and, and that kind of stuff. But I also engage my senses in that moment. So when I feel like the anxiety is just swooping, coming and taking me, that feels very like you're in a storm. You can't see anything clearly. It's it's a tornado kind of feeling. So what I try to do is I try to locate, you know, some, there was a woman in front of me and she had those orange pants. I just like locked my gaze at the orange pants and took it in and started like commenting on that sort of like, you know, it just like step by step. First, I address the body and you write about this in your book. And I am really grateful that somebody finally put the puzzle pieces together. So first addressing the body, calming my nervous system through my own methods, and then engaging my brain, my cognition a little bit. It kind of could be hard. Sometimes it doesn't come very quickly. It doesn't level up with your sensation level, right? With your body and brain are out of sync. I try to bring them together and and then it just, you know, dissipates and it becomes looser and, you know, your body changes. Yeah. That's how I do it. (laughs) Oh, no, that is amazing. That is so, (laughs) so genius. This is so good. And as you were talking through that, you're talking about how you were in real time recalibrating 
restructuring, reprogramming your nervous system. And I think about it, like if you're at the top of a mountain, so if we use the metaphor, you're at the top of a mountain and over years, because of what has happened to you throughout your life, what has not happened to you throughout your life, this mountain has ravines carved into it so that when the stress of rain comes, the water will go down the path of least resistance. And so this is This is how the nervous system is programmed. And so what you did that is so brilliant that I really want to emphasize is that instead of just going with what your nervous system was programmed to do, which is to avoid or to resist or to try to make it go away or to make it stop, is you recalibrated that, you restructured it, you repatterned it. And that's the fourth step. I call this the panic reset. And it's it's like you were going through each stage. And that fourth step is that while you're in autonomic arousal, while your body is in that state of fight, flight, freeze, whatever its unique manifestation of symptoms are, is that you paired that arousal with empowering change. And you were laying down new ravines. You were laying down new habits. And another metaphor that I, that maybe will resonate with some people is like, what happens with trauma is that it's like your car is trying to start an engine. And so you see it revving up. It's like, but it doesn't turn over. And so then we see this, what neuroscientists call somatic reenactment. Somatic is the body. The reenactment is it's trying to finish that loop. And you, by allowing yourself to be in that emotion, like when you saw the orange pants, you allowed yourself to be in that emotion. You allowed that car engine to start up and then you didn't suppress it. You just grounded your body. You followed the four steps. You intuitively through your wisdom and your research, you followed the four steps. You completed that cycle so that the body knew how to handle it. So you're not needing to reenact that anymore. It was, it's just brilliant. I love what you said. If you love the ideas I share here on the podcast, but find that when your kids misbehave, everything you've learned flies out of the window, leaving you yelling or shaming them and feeling awful about it afterward, then the Taming Your Triggers workshop is for you. My friend Jen at Your Parenting Mojo will help you understand the real reasons why you get triggered, begin to heal past hurts, and give you new tools to meet both your needs and your child's needs so you can feel triggered less often. But act fast. Enrollment ends at midnight Pacific on Wednesday, October 9. Jen offers sliding scale pricing and a money back guarantee. Plus, I'll be joining the workshop too. The first 10 people who sign up using my link will receive three 15-minute group coaching calls with me. Don't miss out. Sign up now at AuthenticParenting.com slash workshop. That's AuthenticParenting.com slash workshop. See you there. Well, then that's my practice now. And every time you come out of an anxiety episode or panic episode, you gain more confidence, you gain more data about your own body, about yourself that I can do this. You're more prepared the next time. You're not as scared. And so I think I'm going to say it took me a couple of years to become more at ease, probably practicing this for two years, I'm going to say for sure. It made me better at it. But could you reiterate the four uh, steps that you saw in my description of my anxiety protocol? Yeah. Your <laughs> protocol is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I do appreciate too what you said about it taking two years because I think that one of the natures of anxiety is make it stop, make it stop now. This is scary. And what if it actually hurts me? Can anxiety hurt me? And the research is abundantly clear and that anxiety is not inherently dangerous. Your panic will not hurt you. It's just data. And so even though we have this urgency to make it go away immediately, you were consistent and faithful in this repatterning and reprogramming and it did work. You just stuck with it. So I really want to honor and emphasize that point because it's really key. 
So this is the panic reset. And I have in my book to try to practice this for a minimum of 90 to 120 days. And that's what we see in the nervous system that it takes to create a new habit and even better, keep doing it. So the first step, which is exactly what you said, what you did is we want to calm the nervous system because when your nervous system starts to go into autonomic arousal, we see some things happening in our brain that can be pretty frustrating. And one is that we have all of these emotional parts of the brain that start to fire. So your amygdala starts to fire. This is all part of the default mode network. And the default mode network is like cruise control. It's like the deer that sees the tiger in the woods. And it's like, think of nothing, just escape danger, right? And so then when you, just as you said, Anna, is when you try to think rationally or you try to be logic about it, it doesn't work. You either feel like you're, you get thought anxiety, like your thoughts are muddled or they're racing or they're repetitive or your mind is blank, right? So what we have to do is exactly what you said, is you go to the body, you go to the nervous system and you talked about what I call tips. And then I add more S's, which stands on the shoulders of DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy with Marsha Linehan. And she talks about tips. I just expanded on it, which is tip the temperature. And so if you start noticing you're having a big anxiety attack or autonomic arousal or even a rage attack, you and I were talking about that. However, that arousal showing up is cold can be really fast. It can be really effective to get you out of that autopilot mode. And so you can put your face in a bucket of ice water, but let's be real. Not all of us are like walking around with buckets of ice water and like, hold on a second, dunk, right? So another option is I teach about making panic packs, which you can get these like cool little first aid chemical cold packs where you just, they're small, you stick them in your little bag. And then if you start noticing, whoop, I'm going into arousal, you just shake it and then you place it on your face, on the back of your neck. This can activate your vagus nerve to calm your body. So I love that. So let's tip the temperature. You could also direct and drive the energy out with intense exercise. And so a pattern interrupt is huge. You can get up, you can walk around, you can squeeze your muscles, you could go to the bathroom and come back, whatever you need to do. And then we have the perceptions, right? So you have the smell and the sight and the touch. You saw orange pants. That was brilliant. You noticed it. And then you started speaking about it, which now you're going into step two, which is exactly what you said. It's onboarding your wise and analytical mind. So now that we've gotten you back in your body, we've gotten you out of that autopilot mode. Now you have access to your, your more logical brain. And Dr. Bessel van der Kolk teaches that your prefrontal cortex or your logical brain gets the message more slowly than the emotional brain. So just by hanging tight for just a moment or two, that can really get you a chance for your logical brain to kick in. But once that's on board, then you have more of your personal control and control is what gives you that easefulness. And you talked about that, like I need to practice this. And then the more I do it, the more confidence I'll have, the more control you'll have, right? And so ways to really strengthen this and to strengthen the connection is to do things like focused attention meditation. And so to make this really tangible, because I know that's something you wanted for this conversation is in, this is good for all ages is you can give somebody a mantra to repeat and in transcendental meditation, they have mantras that they assign to you and you repeat that, or you can give your loved one words that would be helpful. Like it's okay. Or I am safe, or I've got this, whatever it feels right. And then you focus your gaze on something. And then as you breathe, you just repeat it again and again. And so that is going to help all of that white noise, all of that busyness, all of that chaos zoom in. And it's hard at first, but if you practice that, you'll see that you have much more quick control over your brain. There's crossword puzzles, games, apps for onboarding wise and analytical mind. So that's the first two steps. I want to take a second because I know I'm monologuing a little bit and, and see what you think about that. No, no, this is perfect. I enjoy hearing you speak. 
I want to hear more about the panic pack. You talk about having this little pouch and putting things. I'm going to ask you after this question, what things can people put into their panic packs if they decide to create one? Yeah, mm-hmm. I built a panic pack for the first time out of necessity because I was having so much anxiety flying. I had this really scary experience 2010. And then after that, my body just decided like, oh, we're going to die on a plane, which logically I'd talked to aerospace engineers. I like took the fear of flying class at the Phoenix International Airport. But as we were talking about your emotional brain, it's like, nope, run from tiger. And so when I was doing research into the onboarding your wise and analytical mind and calming the nervous system is I was like, I don't have any of this on an airplane. What do I do? So I got a cute fanny pack. Mine had pink sequins on it, as you do. And I started to put things in it that would be useful. So for touch, I love different textured things. So there's like a worry stone. It was a pretty crystal. I like shiny things. So I got that. And then there's this particular fidget that I really have found really useful for my clients. And it kind of is shaped like a hair tie and it's got spikes on it. And so it's like a little bit more stimulating. So if the the arousal is bigger, you might need more stimulation. So I have that in there. And then I have a rough rock in there. And then I have something fuzzy in there. So I have little textures. And then there's scent. And so on an airplane, you want to be a little bit mindful about scent, but I often teach my clients that you can take like a little cotton ball in a Ziploc and put a couple of drops of an essential oil and then you can just kind of give it a little sniff. Lavender, there's really good research about how lavender inhalation can activate the part of the brain that sends GABA. So it's really neat. It can calm you. So we have oils in there. I put kava kava in my panic pack. Kava kava is the best. I have a question here in my notes. What is yeah. kava kava? So that's a question I have. So since you're talking about it, why don't you yeah. tell us what it is? <laughs> Hypermethysticum. It's like the best plant. It's so amazing. You can get it at most health food stores. And this plant I was introduced to because I was also afraid of, I had so many different anxiety stories, but I was so afraid of phlebotomy class when I was in medical school. So I get a vasovagal reaction and throw up when we had to practice drawing blood on each other. And so my teacher was going around the room one day and was like, all y'all are really anxious, open up. And so she gave us kava kava tincture. And so it's this extract of the roots of this plant and it doesn't taste very good but it works really well. And the benefits of kava kava is that one, it's been studied to be comparable in some clinical scenarios to a benzodiazepine without the zombie trade-offs. So you take a Xanax, maybe you're less anxious, but now you feel brain dead. You can't think, you can't operate a motor vehicle. Kava kava will calm the body and the nervous system quite quickly but you stay cognitively sharp. So we could all draw blood. We were all present, but we were few less anxious. So I love kava. And you said you can make tea with it. In the book, your friend was having tea, kava kava tea. (laughs) Yeah. In a lot of cities now, we're finding kava bars. And so people are getting kava coffee and kava tea. And so Charlotte in the book was just chugging kava tea. I like it as a tincture because I don't like the taste of kava. So I just rather the concentrated, just like drink it back and follow it with some juice. But yeah, she was just hammering through the kava tea. Oh, interesting. This is pretty interesting. Yeah. So yeah, what, yeah. what else can you put in a panic pack besides the, you know, basically addressing all the senses, right? The touch, the smell, the textures, something to eat. Yeah. Ginger candy. Ginger, yeah is really good. There's a lot of clinical research on ginger and powerful flavors because the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, it goes into the back of the tongue. And so sometimes people will do salt or something really sour, but ginger is also anti-inflammatory and antihistamine. And so when we're thinking about the nine types of anxiety, if you're having a histamine surge, then we have the data, that root cause data, like, okay, histamine's out of balance. What can I do to support histamine? 
stimulate the vagus nerve and calm the body. So it's like feeding several birds with one pellet. So I love ginger rescue remedy. Lozenges are great for kids. They taste good versus ginger, maybe a little strong for some kids. (laughs) And I have a friend who also has anxiety attacks and things like that. And she always has whatever she flies or goes somewhere that she knows that she may feel anxious. She has lemons in her purse so she sucks on a lemon and i know also i think you wrote in your book too right that the sour taste the stronger taste calm the vagus nerve yeah it's amazing so it's like what will work really well for you the research is great with like lemons as you said and other citrus and ginger and some people may find that salt works really well i love the power of experimenting And some people, since I'm talking about flying at the moment, is some people get vasovagal because they get dehydrated when they're flying. And so then their blood pressure crashes. So salt can actually be helpful for that. So putting a little bit of salt on their tongue if they're feeling anxious and dizzy and woozy. And of course, if you have high blood pressure and you're on a DASH diet, low sodium, don't do that. Do other things. But I have a family member who used to pass out on planes all the time. And we figured out there was a medic on a plane who's like her blood pressure crashed. So stop taking your diuretic and bring a little salt packet. You can put it a little bit on your tongue if you start feeling yucky. Okay. So did we finish the four steps to the reset protocol? I want to finish that so then we can go into the nine types of anxiety, which was my favorite part. I'll be briefer. I'll be yes. more brevity. So we did number <laughs> one, which is calm the nervous system. Number two. Why is an analytical mind onboarding? Number three is reintegrating the mind and the body. And so that's where you pay attention to your body. Some people live from the shoulders up. They don't notice their body. They're very dissociated from their body. They're maybe they're a very hyper analytical person. And so a sign that you may benefit from reintegration of the mind and body is if you feel like emotionally I'm not in line with my logic. And you talked about that, like how you're like, I don't know why this is happening. It doesn't make sense. There isn't an activator, but I feel this way. So that's an indicator that there needs to be a process of reintegration. And so doing preventative practice of interoceptive work, which is just a big science term for paying attention to your body, noticing your body. You can do a 30 second exercise every day when you start your day of just maybe starting at the top of your head and just scanning down without judgment or the need to change or do anything and just notice, oh, there's a sensation there. I see you going farther down your body. Oh, there's a gurgling here. I hear you. And then just simply noticing it. And that's good practice. And then the last step, step four, is where we restructure the panic producing patterns. And we just talked about that where you saw the orange, you did the grounding, the breathing. Bessel van der Kolk teaches about doing high ropes courses or other activities that put you into autonomic arousal, but in ways that you are in control and you can choose it because anxiety is really a reaction to a sensation. And so if you can have those sensations but react from a place of curiosity and personal power and control, then it's not anxiety anymore. It's just simply data. So that's the fourth step. Yeah. Before I read the nine types of anxiety that like you also have scoring system, you can figure out which type you are. Just by reading their names, I figured out which one my type is. So that was pretty helpful. Why don't you tell us the nine types of anxieties and maybe a little description that goes with each of them? This is so fun. This is like my favorite thing. And this is so empowering for people because when we have anxiety, our body does all sorts of goofy things. And then we start to worry, is there something wrong with me versus wow, thank you, body, for giving me so much information. Yay, I get to work with it. Thank you, burrito, for telling me that you're there. So now I can get you out, right? So the first type is thought anxiety. And so this is when you are in autonomic arousal and it really manifests in your thoughts. And so they may be racing or obsessive, or you may get brain fog, or maybe you just have like complete ADHD type thoughts. 
And so oftentimes in kids, ADHD is actually undiagnosed anxiety. So thought anxiety, and then we have chest anxiety. And this is anxiety that shows up in your chest. And so you may feel like an elephant is on your chest or your heart is palpitating or air hunger. That's, I used to get a lot of Yeah, mine is chest anxiety for sure. I don't have the thought anxiety. Mine Mm -hmm. is the chest Mm -hmm. one for sure. It's the predominant type. I have another type, but. (laughs) Ooh, that's Mm -hmm. such good data. And so then I would want to do parts work with your chest anxiety, which was the last part of the book. (laughs) <laughs> that would, that's for another conversation, so chest anxiety. So you resonate with that. Mm-hmm. And then we have gut anxiety and you have trillions of bacteria in your gut that are responsible for the, our thoughts, our emotions, our endocrine system, your thyroid, your sex hormones, like estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, these bacteria are in many ways running the show. And so when anxiety shows up in the gut, this is an opportunity to do an audit of what's happening with my gut. Is, am I experiencing nausea? Kids, sometimes they get, they vomit when they're scared before school or they get like, oh, I have a tummy ache. And then we're taking them to a gastroenterologist who's giving them Tums or Prilosec when maybe this is data about something that's out of balance that we could correct with self-work or maybe they're being bullied and we need to deal with their environment. It could be lots of things. So we've got anxiety and then we have endocrine anxiety. And this is anxiety that's caused by or contributing to imbalances in the endocrine system. And this is especially important if your kiddo is going through puberty and there's hormones changing. And this is important for women, cisgender women who are going through their menarche, their perimenopausal. Yes. And so during times or even just their period, we have a story of Esme in the book who has PMDD that was undiagnosed. They're just like, oh, it's all in your head. And she thought her uterus was out to get her. And so we have endocrine anxiety. Let's see, we have immune system anxiety. And this is so important, especially in a post COVID world where our body, our immune systems are producing signs and symptoms that are affecting the nervous system, our thoughts and our brain. And so when we think about immune system anxiety is these are people who may have histamine imbalances. Histamine can be as excitatory and as stimulating as adrenaline. So that chemical that makes your eyes itchy and watery and makes you sneeze could be making you experience panic and insomnia. Or it could be somebody who has an autoimmune disease like autoimmune thyroid or celiac disease or lupus. And so looking at you can give someone with with celiac disease all the benzos that you want, but there's an obstacle to cure if you don't deal with the autoimmunity is those benzos are not going to take care of their anxiety, right? So we have immune system anxiety. We also have trauma anxiety. And this is anxiety that is primarily related to an adversity or a trauma or something that happened, which shows up with intrusive thoughts or nightmares or avoidance of particular situations and triggers. And we see this collectively with our youth who went through most of their schooling wearing masks and being afraid of other kids having germs that can make them very sick. And so now we have all of this trauma anxiety that's showing up. So let's see, we've talked about endocrine thought, chest, gut, immune system, trauma, anxiety. Let's see, what are we missing? We have depressive anxiety. And so this is anxiety that can show up with depression. Oftentimes they overlap. And so you may have feelings of hopelessness and worthlessness and sadness. And then there's anger anxiety. And this is really so important is that when we're in autonomic arousal, we call it fight, flight, freeze. And then in the book, we talk about six of them, but fight is important. So sometimes you may have a kiddo or maybe you feel this way. It's just really agitated, really irritable. You may have rage attacks, but oftentimes underneath of that, it's really fear and anxiety. And so, especially in Ayurveda, we have even more opportunities for correcting that imbalance by knowing the way that it shows up. So I think we covered all, all nine of them. Yeah. Which types did you have? 
I had nervous system anxiety. Oh yeah. We didn't talk about nervous system anxiety. Thank you for asking that. You were intuitive there. Nervous system anxiety. This shows up in primarily in the nervous system. So I had burning pains in my muscles. It was like someone took coals out of the fire and just put it on under my muscles and skin. Some people get brain zaps. They dissociate, they get brain, they get headaches, they get nerves like zapping and shooting, or they'll say like my left side of my face is numb. Am I having a stroke? And it could be a panic attack. So those are, thank you. Those are the nine types. Yeah. I think it's very helpful. And of course you can have a predominant style. Like I have the chest anxiety and I also have the nervous system or trauma anxiety, I think more specifically, it's useful to know. And it just immediately, you can find solutions, which you talk about in your book about the brain, about neurotransmitters. Let me tell you, this book is so rich with science, but it's very accessible. And so what are the six types of stress response? I think as time goes on, people add new Fs to the flight freeze. <laughs> and I read the six now in your book. I'm like, ah, oh, this is interesting. Yeah. So fight is when we get angry and we fight back. And then flight is when we have the urge to run away and escape. Freeze is like a deer in headlights. And then flop is sheep do this, right? If you see a sheep, it gets stuck to a fence. It tries to get away. It can't. It's just like, well, it's over. And so then when the shepherd comes, they have to remove the sheep and then they have to force it to walk around for a while for it to get the picture like, oh, we're okay. It's because it's in a flop. And then fawn is, that's my main way of responding to trauma is that you try to appease or get approval or safety from the perceived authority. And I think that's a really under discussed trauma response. We all like fawners. We're like, oh, you're so nice and you please me. We love that. But it could be a trauma response. It may be out of suffering. It could be data. They need healing in that way. And then fracture. This is a especially new. And this is what surprised me the most. Yeah. The yeah. fracture. Yeah. We see this, especially in the work of parts work. We saw it studied, especially in people who struggle with multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder, but that's an extreme sort of fracturing where the stress on the system is so extreme that the body's just like, the mind, we're just like, we're out. We can't do it anymore. And so in extreme DID, we see that people will go into complete distinct and separate identity states. In fact, some can have glucose intolerance. And then when they go into a different identity state, they won't have glucose intolerance. It's just very interesting scientifically how the brain and the body does this. But we see that also on a spectrum and a continuum. Everybody dissociates. If you've gotten in your car and driven to your job as you have a thousand other times and you get there and you're like, oh, I don't really remember that drive. You dissociated. Those moments when you're in flow and you lose track of time, you're dissociating. And so what happens in a fracture is that as a result of adversity, stress, or trauma, our body creates parts. And so when you get activated, you have a part that will step in to try to protect you. And in the research and in internal family systems, they've given names to these. So you have the firefighter and the exile, and it's just different ways to try to understand how we can feel in conflict about things. And so maybe when you go and you hang out with your siblings, one part of you comes out and they say things and they get your goat and you're like, why did I respond that way? That's a part of you. And then there's another part that shows up on these podcasts and you are smart and you are with it and you're compassionate and you're like, this is the best version of me, right? And then you go to the grocery store and someone cuts you off and they steal the last orange and you're like, right? So we have different parts and they're, they've adapted to try to protect us in different scenarios. And so in fracture, we see disintegration of all of those parts. People get hijacked and they're like, I can't help myself. I just do it. Or this just happens. And so what the treatment would be is different versus if you're in flop 
and you have no stimuli and your blood pressure's crashed out, or if you're in fight and you have high blood pressure and your ears are all steaming, but if you're in a fracture, the treatment is different. And so knowing that we have six F's can really help us be specific about what happened, didn't happen and what to do. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And FYI for the listener, I want to remind if maybe there's a new listener or a regular listener, if they haven't listened to that episode, I did interview Dr. Dick Schwartz and he did in fact do like a real time session with me about Mm -hmm. that chest anxiety thing that I was having. And it was very useful. And there is another episode that talks about IFS with Dr. Frank Anderson. I can't remember off the top of my head what number it is, but it's from 2024. Um, I think it's called Truth, Trauma, and Transformation. So there's lots of episodes out there that we have done. And I just want to plug a few for the listener to go back and listen to those episodes as well. You mentioned hormones and you call it endocrine anxiety. I think I want to speak about this just a little bit because as a perimenopausal woman, I'm, you know, I just turned 50 this year. I know how hormones can affect my anxiety specifically a few years ago. And I know a lot of women in their forties who are experiencing Uh, anxiety, quote unquote, out of nowhere. And they say things like, oh, I never dealt with anxiety. Now I have panic attacks. What is this? So based on my personal experience, you know, I know that hormones play a huge role. There comes a time in your 40s when you really feel anxious because of the disbalance between hormones. But I also know that when I talk to Dr. Ellen Bora, and I know she endorsed your book, that's why I keep, yeah. I, I keep mentioning her. I, <laughs> yes. I lo- love her work. It was truly life-changing for me, her book, her approach, because she talks about two types of anxiety, right? A true anxiety, and false anxiety, which are maybe not good terms to describe the types of anxieties that she talks about, but it was very helpful for me to know that. And I think that's when I learned the first time the power of managing my blood glucose level to avoid anxiety spikes. Um, And so ever since I read that book, I interviewed her, I am really mindful of how I eat, even though I was a healthy eater, but now I know how to eat to have a steady glucose level and those anxiety attacks are non-existent because of that. So female, let's talk about a little bit and you go in in depth in the book about, you know, hormones, neurotransmitters and everything, but Can we talk about a little bit about the gut, about, you know, female hormones and everything that I just said, Um, because these are the whys of anxiety, right? There are many root causes for anxiety. And I feel like so many women who are perimenopausal get really frustrated and feel invalidated when they go and either their doctor's like, your hormones change that's just how it is. Do you want HRT? Or their doctor is like, okay, we'll run testing. Yeah. You're, you're perimenopausal. That's what we expected. And there's nothing you can do about it. And so it can feel really frustrating and invalidating. And there's so many different directions we can go with this, but I want to mention this one piece because I, I suspect that perhaps it hasn't been mentioned enough. And so We can have completely normal levels of hormones and still suffer as a result of changes in hormones. And in the book, I talk about this in a couple of ways. One is phasic vulnerability. And so what that means is that even if your hormones are perfect, the sheer art of them changing may cause suffering. You may cause insomnia. And so it it could cause panic, it could cause depression, brain fog, all the things, night sweats, right? But but your doctor's just going to say, well, it's normal. And so phasic vulnerability is something first. And second is you can have totally normal levels of hormones, but they may not be behaving appropriately if you have environmental 
toxic exposures. So for example, the clinical literature has shown that minerals like magnesium and iron and iodine, like different things like that can look quite similar in biochemistry, according to your body to toxic metals like lead and mercury and cadmium, right? And so if you have had exposure to that, which if we color our hair and we use lipstick and all sorts of personal care products is we're getting exposed to these and that these metals can get grabbed by the body and get stuck in neural pathways that maybe magnesium was supposed to be in. And so even though the hormones are there, the pathway is broken. And so then we're anxious and we're on prescription medications and then we're given more medications and we still suffer, right? So this is, this is why it's so important to understand obstacles to cure and understand what might be getting in the way of our body being healthy because your body is trying to tell you it's just our job to understand it. So in terms of hormones, so that's the bucket for people for all people, but especially perimenopausal women who have had totally normal tests or who feel invalidated by their tests, right? And then the second piece is that not all estrogen is created equal. And so if you have a, a, an adequate doctor, they'll run estradiol. That's E2. That's your dominant premenopausal estrogen. And then they'll tell you, oh, it's high, low, or normal, whatever. A very good doctor we'll look at an estrogen panel that has E1, E2, and E3. Those are the three main types of estrogen. And and may, may I pause you for a second? And how do they run that test? Is it the blood work? These are both blood tests. And if if you have good insurance and your doctor is good at coding, oftentimes this could all be covered by insurance. And may I estrogen. just say, I've never, this was never proposed to me or never offered by my doctor. And she's like amazing, right? That's what I think. And now you're raising an interesting idea. So you're making me aware of something I was never aware of. I'm so passionate about this. And there's an even better test. And so we're going to use the metaphor of kindergartners to talk about estrogen. <laughs> and so estrogen, E1, E2, E3, the body breaks them down. And so we have pathways in our liver. This is in the book, the cytochrome P450 pathways. They break down your estrogens and they can break down estrogens into healthy, good, beautiful, balanced forms of estrogens or problematic estrogens that can increase your risk of hot flashes and night sweats and mood swings and menopausal symptoms and estrogen related cancers and stress on the damage to the DNA. And the metaphor for this is if you have 10 kindergartners in classroom A and we gave them all cookies and mm, soda with caffeine in it, right? And they're like, ah, they're running around. And then in classroom B, you have the same number of kindergartners, but you're playing relaxing music. The lights are low. They're all laying on yoga mats and you've given them reading a story. So both, both classrooms have the same number, the estrogen, the number is the same, but your lived experience walking into each of those rooms is completely different. And so that's the joy of estrogen metabolites, because if you can test that, which my favorite, there's, I have no endorsement by Dutch, but I love Dutch, D-U-T-C-H, Dutch test. It's a urine test. It's cash pay, sadly. But if you can get that information it may be as easy as changing the way your body is metabolizing your estrogen. So you may not need hormone replacement therapy. You may need a detox. You may need something like DIM or calcium deglucurate or fiber or probiotics to change how your body's metabolizing it. And then symptoms of anxiety with perimenopause for many of my women goes away. So those are kind of two main buckets with respect to estrogen. Wow, this is so uh, great. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. And I, of course, I can't conclude this episode by bringing up the topic of grief, which also can lead to anxiety, right? This is kind of like emotional buildup of things that lead to anxiety. And I personally experienced this too, and I overcame it. And so I know that it was so, so real. 
Is there anything you want to say to that or? Yeah. So I, I honor and I see you and I am so grateful that you are willing to be vulnerable and share that with your, with me and with your listeners. And we live in a world that is fundamentally out of tune with our human nature. We live with stress and we live with overwhelm and our needs don't always get met. And grief is such a natural, valid human experience that I feel like has become pathologized. Like oh, you have bereavement disorder, somebody that you loved and cherished, they've passed. And we're going to give you a diagnosis of bereavement disorder. And if that lasts longer than the DSM thinks is normal, then we're going to give you a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. And so we've started to pathologize our normal human, our natural human, our valid human suffering. And depressive anxiety it's a manifestation of grief and having anxiety can be so despairing and so traumatizing and we get fear of the fear. And so when we, when we're doing the inner work and we're working on healing and we're looking at our labs and we're looking at our diet and we're looking at our healing, I really encourage all of us to do that inner child work is to talk to that part of you that is expressing an unmet need and to show up for yourself. So earlier we were talking about doing a body scan, starting at the top of your head and working your way down. And so in just interoceptive awareness, we just notice it and we move on, but doing that grief work. And so if you notice something, let's say that it's in your chest and you can place your hands on your chest and you can say, okay, I hear you. Thank you for sharing your voice. I acknowledge you. I honor you. I am grateful for you. And I want you to know that I've got you and that in the present, I have resources now that you didn't have. And there's education and opportunities that I have now that you didn't have. And I want you to let go of the need to control and take care of me and let me take care of you. And so if that's grief, if that's loss is imagine that noticing that part and ask that part to set down the need to carry that and allow you to carry it. This is part of that fracture, right? This is your younger self, that griefing self and allow it to set that down. I always use the image with my patients of a backpack, set down that backpack and feel what it would be like to let go of that. Give yourself permission to have joy, receive, don't resist, right? And then allow you as the adult and your current resources to hold that space. And then that will give you the freedom to move through it instead of suppressing and avoiding. And that can repattern that mountain and those ravines to a place of honor and power. That's what I think I would say about grief. Mm, thank you so much. It was such a joy connecting with you. And I love the book. I love what you shared. This is great. I may have to have you again <laughs> in the future. I, I love repeat guests who can, you know, offer so much. This was great. I love it. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I want to give you an opportunity to share with the listener where they can find you online or purchase a book. What's the best place for them to go to connect with you? Thank you for the honor of being here. First of all, thank you. I love your work. I respect you so much. So thank you. I would love to come back and I would love, I can't wait to read the work that you have coming out. <laughs> and I would Love to be, to stay connected. I'm pretty active on Instagram. So it's Dr. Nicole Kane and there's a link there and my book Panic Proof comes out in October. And so I would be ever so grateful if you would buy it and there it's anywhere major books, sellers are having books. So Amazon and Barnes and Noble and your local bookstore. So I would be ever so grateful. So thank you. Oh, thank you. 